Welcome to Public Power Underground, Northwest Public Power's premier weekly infotainment program that covers Northwest public power and public power adjacent news from the power department's perspective. So hey, public power people, on today's show, we'll get an update on Northwest power markets on air and reports, talk markets with TEA's 2FAN, get a Northwest River Partners double feature with Kurt Miller and Austin Rohr, Talk blue sky ideas with Roger Klein in another dispatch from this special Salmon War correspondent, Matt Shretnik, and cover more public power and public power adjacent news on Public Power Desktop. I'm the voice of the underground and economic development manager for Klatskin IPUD, Brian Fawcett. I'm Paul Dockery, the manager of the power department and co-host of Public Power Underground. This is Aaron Guillory, the star of Aaron Reports, co-star of Public Power Underground and financial analyst for Klatskin IPUD. I'm the current power analyst, co-star of Public Power Underground, and Grammar Police Captain Ian Bledsoe. You got a raise? You got promoted? <laughs> definitely a promotion. I, I, you got I've another bar? Is that a bar? What is that? Those quotas of uh, fines. <sighs> I mean, I really like the sound of Lieutenant Bledsoe, <laughs> kind of like Lieutenant Dan. <laughs> but I'll go with Captain Bledsoe, I guess. <laughs> Not getting any pushback here. You've earned it. You've earned that stripe. I actually don't even know if captain is a higher rank than lieutenant. <laughs> yeah, I wasn't sure. sure if it was a promotion or a demotion. <laughs> pretty sure it's a promotion. <laughs> okay. All right. We're starting this week, like most weeks, checking in on power market indicators in the Northwest with our first segment, Aaron Reports. All right. This is Aaron Reports, where we try to get up to speed on Northwest market indicators for April 15, 2021. I'm Aaron Guillory, and I've got your market update for the week. April September flows of the Dells are expected to be at 88% of normal, down 2% for last week. Outflow at the Dells peaked over the past week at 160.1 KCFS on April 7th at 2000 hours. Midday elevation of Grand Coulee on April 14th was 1270.1, same as reported last week as peak outflows increased from a peak of 128.4 KCFS on April 5th at 0800 hours to peak outflow of 143.5 KCFS on April 12th at 0800 hours. Checking on snow in the region using answers to aggregation of basin data, the snow water equivalent for BC Hydro Generation Basin is 113.59% of normal for mid-sea 114 Uh, 0.43% and aggregating all of the snow in the Columbia River Basin that'll flow through the Bonneville Dam. They estimate there is a 95.65% of normal snow blanket. Spot market power in the Northwest for delivery April 14th is at $37.71 with gas at 268 per MMBTU, translating to a spark spread of 1868 and a heat rate of 15 grand. In term markets, BOM for mid-sea has climbed again up $3.44. From a week ago now at 34.91 per megawatt hour. Mid sea power for Q3 2021 is at 96.50 with Sumas gas at 3.23, translating to a heat rate of 30,500. Taking a look at fish counts for adult spring Chinook this week. Um, again, 38 Chinook passed through the Bonneville Dam on Monday, an eight count up from last week. Spending a beat at Bonneville's Balancing Authority peak load this past week was 81.50, April 9th at 7.25 in the a.m. During load peak, hydrogen was at 9,368. Wind gen was at 264 megawatts. Conventional units were at 1067 and nuclear was at 1077. Uh, this week in NOAA climate forecast, the six to 10 day outlook again has temp in the region with a 33 to 60% chance of being above normal with layers with the normal to growing probability of being above as you head east. Precipitation in the region largely has a 33 to 50% chance of being below and their 90 day report shows likelihood of a 33 to 60% chance of being uh, below normal precip. And that's all we've got for this update. Back to you, Brian. I wanted to know. <laughs> In upcoming news, the Columbia Generating Station's 40-day fuel refueling outage starts May 8th. And I also did want to note that, Aaron, uh, we're, we're recording this early this week. It's 8 a.m. There's a window. There's light streaming in through my window. And uh, she did her script yesterday, which is why our term prices shown on my screen are a little different than what Aaron just read out. And moving on, we got uh, joining us this week to talk markets and digest air reports is the Energy Authority's Northwest Energy Authority, their director of Power Trading West, and a friend of the underground, Two Fan. Hi, Two. Welcome to Public Power Underground. Good to be here. It's Big fan of the show. Really, really good to have you. I'm honored that you've even watched any of the shows. Um, we are not experts on markets. I've never been a trader. Aaron, have you ever been a trader? Oh, I'm an accountant. 
What is exactly. trading? <laughs> we we try not to overrepresent our knowledge about this topic, and we like to have experts on who know more. So thank you. I consider you an expert too. Thank you. Um, <laughs> definitely not an expert. Always a student of the game. That's the right take. <laughs> I love it. So if you've seen the show, yeah. you know we kind of go through these market indicators that we've kind of come to through trial and error. Um, and, and we kind of go through, okay, what's, what's hydro volume forecast at the Dow's? What's the Dow flows? That kind of thing. High level, macro stuff. Uh, but it seems like over the years or over the year, course of the year, different indicators matter more. Like we tracked La Nina uh, during the winter months. Uh, then we tracked snow. Um, and now Brian Fawcett's really focused on us tracking fish. Um, I don't know if you even care about bond markets, but we talk about those sometime. Um, so I was kind of hoping <laughs> to get your, just for me. <laughs> it's for me too. I love it. I think it's a really helpful indicator for those, you know, oh. right. Um, uh, I was wondering if you could give like, are we looking at the right things generally? Is there anything we're missing? And as we go into the summer, is there something beyond snow that we should transition to before we start talking El Nino in the, the winter? Sure. Um, like I said, big fan of the show and, um, uh, big fan of Aaron's segment. Um, and I, I definitely think you're, you're looking at all the right things. Um, same, same things that everyone else in the market is looking at. Um, you know, nothing, nothing really new under the sun there. Um, I guess how I generally approach the market is um, kind of just starting with a, a very macro thesis on uh, what are the big drivers of, of supply and demand. Um, so the, the two things that come to mind for Northwest markets are our, our water and weather. Um, I think for, for water, just being uh, paying attention to how the snowpack evolves throughout the year uh, and how it might, how, how, the, how the melt might, might materialize um, is, is definitely a, one, one thing to keep, um, to keep in the headlights. Um, so um, on the demand side, I would say just paying attention to the weather and, and and, and no one can predict the weather with full accuracy. So um, just keeping a very wide lens on how things evolve and, and a very open mind on what could happen uh, is important. It seems like as you go through the, the year, the, the water variability is, can be really wide um, in the kind of early, the, the shoulder month, spring months, like a wide variability in what you can get out of it. In the summer, it seems the water variability tightens up. So in those summer months, is tracking the demand side even more important because you can have large swings in your load because of weather? Is, is, is that kind of a transition where demand side drives the market more in the summer and fall because hydro is so tight? Sure. Um, you know, fortunately, you can, you can follow the evolution of, of, of hydro kind of programmatically uh, in, in, in the way that um, uh, kind of starting all the way back from September uh, as BPA prepares, prepares for, um, for uh, chum operations. Okay. Uh, and then just monitoring how the snowpack evolves um, kind of throughout the winter. Because by February, March, you know, there, there's no more accumulation. And really, really you are paying attention to then how the weather progresses uh, and how the, how the supply might, might run off. So um, that's the, so, how warm is it in uh, Calais Bell, Montana uh, to when the snow is going to melt kind of thing? Exactly. Um, there's just a certain, uh, th there's an, there's a temperature range where, you know, your snow densities, um, they ripen and, and your snowpack ripens and, and ultimately everything just turns to water. Um, so between monitoring how the snowpack builds and then ultimately runs off, um, by summertime, your, your, eyes are, your eyes are then on the weather um, because your supply is, is, is known at that point uh, and is no longer accumulating. So. I know we, so water obviously is the big question of the game when we're looking at um, supply, but would there ever be any reason, even as you're kind of shifting your focus on um, 
weather as we go into the warmer months to start looking at other uh, um, energy resources? Or is it really just the, the weather at that point? Um, you, mean, you mean what are factors, I guess, beyond uh, the snowpack melt from the generation side? Right, like would it be relevant to look at, uh, I don't know, battery storage or other types of resources? Sure. Natural gas. Is natural gas really important in August? Yeah. Yeah. I think uh, from the natural gas side, um, which I think is the second, it would be the second largest um, kind of bucket of supply in the Northwest, uh, aside from hydro, just definitely important to pay attention to the, the price of fuel. Uh, and what is the what is the price of natural gas? You know, kind of that determines that um, the marginal cost for energy um, mm -hmm. at that part of the stack. And then, um, and then the other thing would just be be to pay attention to outages, whether planned or unplanned, um, because if they are if they are units that are significant in size, um, those can move markets as well. Um, mm -hmm. And is it unit generation, generation unit outages, transmission outages? How much do transmission outages like on the inner time matter um, in those throughout the year? And, and do they matter differently in different times of the year? They matter quite a bit and they matter quite a bit um, in periods where kind of like adjacent markets that are connected uh, by, by a finite amount of transmission capacity, um, mm -hmm. how they lean on one another through different parts of the year. So, you know, if you look at WEC, it's a, a cluster of symbiotic markets um, that are interconnected by very, very, very finite flows. So if, if, a, if a major 500 kV line goes on unplanned outage or a mylar balloon hits the, hits, hits, hits the transmission line and, and, and nukes everything, it's um, in, in the summertime, you know, when demand is very, is, is higher than most, other periods of the year, that's when it matters. Gosh. Yeah, I think we've seen that. Um, uh, was it, I think uh, in our, some of our discussions with Aunt Sergi, very recent in the last year when, even when there's a planned outage or you know this generating resource will be down, similar to the investment market, you will see just such um, exponential responses within the market directly impacting prices and... <laughs> yeah. Crazy. Thinking about it is um, there, there are times of the year, and I think you could classify them as like the shoulder periods where, you know, there's not a whole lot of demand uh, relative to other periods where if, if things like the, this happen, you know, generation goes down, transmission goes down, it's, it's, it is less impactful than the, the other periods of the year. Um, okay. Definitely. And I think when you, when you have that scenario, so like one example would be it's, you know, summer heat wave, temperatures are screaming, demand is screaming across the grid. And you have some very key, um, you know, supply resources or transmission resources that go down unplanned. You know, that's, that's when things can get very interesting. Um, prices go into to discovery mode. Discovery mode. Uh, I think I think you've named the episode with your cluster of symbiotic markets. Was that it? <laughs> I like yeah. that term. I think you just named the episode. <laughs> cluster of symbiotic markets. Yeah. Um, and I think you also gave us an indicator that we should start tracking maybe in the summer with transmission outage and transmission capability. We'll try to find somewhere where we can maybe uh, get a get a headline uh, number we can Aaron can report yeah, on. I think BPA has some. They report their outages. I think somewhat real time. I haven't tracked them too closely um, on a day to day basis, but they'll report report their outages. Yeah, it's a new area of research for us and a new depth we can delve into. So thank you too. That's great. This is great. <laughs> <laughs> but before I let you go. Okay, this is public power adjacent in that it's not public power related and it's adjacent in that I'm interested in it. So I had these two things. Uh, see the letters NFT occurring a lot in my news feeds and I see Top Shot occurring a lot in my news feed. And uh, just yesterday I realized they're connected 
Top Shot is an NFT. Do you know anything about NFTs and any hot takes for us? Uh, I am familiar with NFTs. Um, by no means an expert, but again, also a student of the, of the game. Um, I guess I just will say this about NFTs and, and, and new things that are emerging uh, in, in technology and so quickly these days is that I, I personally believe, you know, there's, there's, there's a hype cycle uh, that generally always occurs when new, new things emerge. And I think the, the hype is generally, generally right, um, but it's just early. So for I mean, NFTs, I, it's... Um, did you name this episode twice? It, the hype is generally right. I mean, that's public power underground. The hype is generally right. I, <laughs> I, I cut you off, but I think you've named the episode twice now. What am I going to do? Anyway, I cut <laughs> you off. Trigger words. Thank you. Yeah, no. Um, I, I, I think that the concept of, of non-fungible tokens is fascinating. Um, you know, they're, they're real life applications. I think uh, no one knows yet. Um, you know, it, it remains to be seen. Um, so we'll see. Um, you know the game. Do you own any top shots yet? I do not own it. Not owning any top shots. No. Okay. I I'm, I'm really interested in the legendary tier. I can't afford any of them, but I bet there's some great top shots, some great memes. Gifts? I don't actually know. Are these gifts that they're selling, or they're not memes? Vines? I think I'm. I think they're vines. Are they vines? Do you remember Vine too? I do remember Vine. Yes. I remember Vine. I love Vine. <laughs> okay. Thank you for joining us. This has been great. You named the episode twice. I don't know how I'm going to pick one, but we're going to pick <laughs> one. I had a lot of fun. Thanks for having me. Yeah. It. Glad you had fun. Thank Thanks, you. Aaron. This was great. Thanks for the report, Aaron. Next up is our weekly walkthrough, Northwest Public Power and Public Power Adjacent News and a segment we like to call Public Power Desktop. So two connected the dots between NFTs and MBA top shots, but you might be wondering, what is an NFT anyhow? Well, it stands for non-fungible token. And after literal minutes of reading about it, I'm probably the wrong person to explain what that actually is. But if you're interested in finding out more about NFTs like NBA Top Shot, head over to The Verge and check out their article explaining this up and coming art like collector phenomena. One more comment is I'm slightly disappointed that we chose a LeBron. I like LeBron, but we chose a LeBron James Top Shot instead of Damian Lillard hitting a 38 foot three to send Oklahoma City home in the playoffs a couple of years ago. Is, did, that so is that Top, top shot, shot out there? Is that is that Top Shot out there? I honestly don't know. Well, that's the thing. Like these images Lillard, right? are getting released. It's not like all of of all the Damian Lillard shots are all available on Top Shot. There's like that's lines. like an iconic shot. Though. Well, of course it is. So have you started I'm collecting? Have, to go check after. have you started collecting Top Shots yet, Brian? No. I mean, this. Why are you no, spending your I... time on? Why are you spending your time collecting baseball cards at this point? It's top shot or bust. <laughs> I think I'm priced out of the market on uh, top shot. No, nah, here's a $6 one. You can get a mellow oh. top shot for six bucks or a thousand. I don't understand what they're doing but here. Do I want a mellow. Oh yeah. That was a lot. That was a lot of adjacent <laughs> news. Let's go Seattle. Seattle city light is building its own Island. Heck of a headline from clearing up on a Dan Catpole article reading Seattle city light is building its own Island. Electrical Island Islanding used to be scary. Now it's trendy. Of course, Dan is referring to a microgrid test bed, which I don't believe is a physical island, but we'll have to follow up with Dan at Dan at DCatchPole on Twitter. The project integrates a 48 kilowatt of uh, rooftop solar with a 200 kilowatt lithium ion battery storage system. The University of Washington is helping the project by providing analysis of the microgrid's system benefits. You can le learn more by reading Dan's article and clearing up or by searching for the, the Miller Community Center microgrid project on seattle.gov. In another public power underground innovation, we're introducing double feature guest news. Northwest River Partners Executive Director Kurt Miller returns to talk about reframing, a frequently asked question followed by a first time appearance by Northwest River Partners Media and Communication Specialist, Austin Rohr. <laughs> We've never done this at 8 a.m. <laughs> a whole different person at 8 a.m. Roar 
You bitches can go. <laughs> oh my god. Yeah, you're not getting out of this one. This okay. Is- I'm I'm pretty sure Austin's gonna be okay with this. So keep going, I guess. Oh, excellent. Okay. Whew. <laughs> to talk about sources to better understand the science between fit or behind fish and orca recovery strategies. Kurt, we're back on the underground. <laughs> it's great to be back. It is. I really like having you back. Great energy. Love this. So most recently, the Portland Business Journal released one of your op-eds, and it was a reframing around the discussion about the relative cost, you know, cost propositions of renewables, hydro, wind, solar. You reframe the yeah. question, um, and in 200 words or less, how would you reframe it, and what's your point? Hey, yeah. So first of all, Paul, thanks for having me. Um, I, I also want to give you kudos uh, so people know how things can kind of work behind the scenes in the underground uh, is that I shared kind of my op-ed, a draft op-ed with Paul. And it's like, you know what? Uh, let's not just get straight into dollars, but let's talk about what hydropower can do. And that was a great suggestion. And I, I uh, re- revamped the whole thing and I really liked how it turned out. So the short version is... Um, People often want to know if wind and solar power are now cheaper than hydropower. In a recent Portland Business Journal op-ed, I made the case that they are asking the wrong question. The Biden administration has called for a carbon-free U.S. electric grid by 2035. The cost of this decarbonization effort will likely amount to trillions of dollars. This is one of the reasons the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine recently called upon Congress to preserve operating hydroelectric facilities wherever possible, to ensure that we don't overburden vulnerable communities with excessive costs. But aside from being renewable and affordable, hydropower brings something invaluable to the table, the ability to help us add even more renewables to the grid. Hydropower dams do this by storing more water when electricity isn't needed and releasing it past hydroelectric turbines when it is. This unique ability helps us to keep the grid in balance as we add intermittent wind and solar power. Malcolm Wolf, the CEO of the National Hydropower Association, probably puts it best when he says, hydropower is a clean energy force multiplier. In short, to fight climate change, we'll need our best carbon-free energy options on the table. Hydropower's special capabilities mean that it should be at the top of the list. Thanks. I love the hydropower is a clean force multiplier. I think that is a great quote and I love that you use it. Um, and I really like the reframing when you get the question about the cost of wind, solar versus hydropower that you're asking the wrong question. This is gonna be massive project and hydropower is a low cost resource that exists today. Use it, use it to make yeah, everything better. Use them all. Yeah. yeah, exactly. These things work best together. Uh, we saw in Texas and ERCOT where, you know, a lot of different resources struggled. So the greater diversity you have of your resources, the better chance that you're going to be able to weather a storm like that, both literal and figuratively. So thanks again, Paul. Yep. Thank you. And uh, this is a double header for Northwest River Partners. We're going to check in with Austin next. It's going to be great. I'm very excited about the double header innovation for Public Power Underground. Austin's the power behind the throne. So yeah, absolutely. Welcome to Public Power Underground, Austin. Hey, it's good to be on. I'm a longtime listener and first time caller, or at least I think that's what you're supposed to say. Uh, I don't know, like Zoomer, long time Zoomer. I guess I don't technically, know. yeah. I don't, I don't know. Yeah. We don't have to get all caught up in the weeds with it. <laughs> yeah, let's not do that. So, um, uh, you were just referred to by Kurt as the main power behind the throne, which in some ways oh, must good. mean that he's the king in a throne. I mean, that maybe is a little high and mighty. We'll have to let him know that, you know, he's just an executive director. He's not a king. I mean, come on. <laughs> um, but he did uh, on LinkedIn. He gave you a shout out the other day about your contribution to an uh, article he wrote or an op-ed he wrote about orcas. Uh, yes. So wanted to give you an opportunity to give a, some insight into the research you did for this and maybe where I can dive into some of the underlying research that you've done so I can better understand it. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, first off, I'll start by saying that, you know, in terms of kind of doing the research, so to speak, we've been really fortunate that, you know, a lot of this kind of comes up in the meetings that we attend and things like that. And so, um, you know, we don't have to go digging too deep um, to come across these things. But um, the bulk of the data that we've recently been referencing comes from two peer reviewed studies 
that have been conducted by NOAA scientists. Um, and we actually have both of these studies posted on our website, uh, on our resources page. So um, really easiest way is to find them there um, rather than trying to hunt down those links yourself. Um, while the studies are independent from each other, we think that they're really critical to challenging the notion that hydropower is responsible for kind of the struggles of Chinook salmon and Southern resident orcas that we're used to seeing so much kind of, you know, in the media and things like that. Um, and furthermore, when you, you look at these findings from the several studies that have been published over the past year or so, uh, we start to see kind of this bigger picture being painted. Um, those other studies would include things from, you know, uh, NOAA's research on juvenile fish size and how that affects their survival through the hydro system. And also uh, research that we've pointed to in the past from like Kintama research up in Canada, where they talk about, you know, kind of the coastwide decline of Chinook salmon overall. Um, and to kind of briefly summarize, I think what we're learning from this new research is that salmon originating from the Snake River really represent a tiny uh, seasonal portion of the Southern resident orca's diet. Uh, I think it's somewhere around two to 5% off the top of my head. Um, you'll sometimes hear kind of the counter argument that's like, well, you know, if you had more of those fish, they would make up for the loss of the Fraser River and the Puget Sound stocks that has kind of been really critical to those orcas. But if you look at like the run timing and um, just sort of the typical, you know, travel and migration of the orcas as well, it would suggest that that's probably not the case. Um, they're just not crossing paths. Um, you know, we don't have a lot of great research to show where they go in the ocean because uh, it's a big body of water and we're talking about, you know, millions of fish and whatnot. But uh, just in terms of, of kind of what we're seeing on uh, the other end of things when we have evidence of those salmon being eaten, um, you know, we're not seeing a ton of interaction between these two groups. Um, as far as the Chinook study goes, that one really pointed more to kind of climate change and the alarming estimates um, about kind of the, the future of those salmon. Um, and not just, you know, not just the salmon that are threatened or endangered in the Columbia River Basin, but as far as, you know, Chinook kind of here in the Northwest altogether, um, their models are showing a really low survivability in the marine life stage for Chinook across the West Coast, and that's putting them at high risk of extinction in just two to three decades. Um, we've seen a really strong correlation between ocean conditions and low salmon returns over the past few years. And we're currently on a really worrying path towards more frequent spikes in ocean temperatures. Um, and just as a quick aside, something that I wanna clear up because I think it's really important to this conversation. You know, when those temperatures go up in the water, uh, the water actually becomes more acidic. That's where you hear that term like uh, ocean acidification. And that acidification is really harmful to the development of the planktons that the salmon feed on. If there's not enough of that food, enough of those planktons, uh, you just aren't going to have large, bountiful populations of salmon. Um, and so when we look at it from that perspective, it's really hard to argue that any changes that you make in the river is going to solve the problem for fish once they hit the ocean and they're struggling to find food. Um, yeah, I hadn't heard that linkage between ocean acidification to plankton to salmon. Um, and right. it's probably because I'm not very deep into the research. So <laughs> I'm really glad that you are. Um, I like that y'all are posting this on your website. I'll be actually able to go find it. So thank you. And I particularly like Kurt's messaging in these articles where, you know, you did this research that mm -hmm. linked back to following the science, trying to understand and do the research. We actually have caused like, so we're following science on the best way to, to help the fish, which is the goal. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, that's the thing, right? It's not all doom and gloom. You know, if we listen to the research and we act on the findings, we can actually make some really important informed decisions about how we're managing these resources to give salmon and orcas the best chance possible. And, you know, in some cases it's kind of, you know, as unlikely as it sounds, you know, hydropower can be a really critical component to that in terms of talking about the climate change impacts. Um, you know, as you can imagine, it's a bit tricky trying to get everyone uh, on the same side, given how political the issue is. But, you know, we're really optimistic that conversations like this are what are going to help us get there.
yeah, nuanced conversations. Kurt brought this to Public Power <laughs> Underground as we're not just trying to be ad- blind advocates for hydropower. We're trying to have nuanced conversation and really nuances is, is what we need more nuance in this conversation. So thank you for that. Thanks for coming yeah. on Public Power Underground. This is awesome. A double header and the first time you've made it. So awesome, Austin. Hey, I'm stoked to be on here. Thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. We'll see what Guillory dialed up for me here. In a recent report issued last month by the Government Accountability Office, the GAO recommended that the U.S. Department of Energy ensure its national cybersecurity strategy plans include utility distribution systems. Primary concerns cited included the rise in vulnerability due to industrial control systems adding remote access and connections to business networks and the inability of these legacy systems to enact user authentication and modern encryption protocols. Although the pervasiveness and significance of any impact due to cybersecurity attacks on the distribution system are not clear at this point. The article seems to highlight missed implementation of certain important system controls, as many distribution systems have generally been unmanaged or unpatched, simply air-gapped from IT networks and internet in general, running on lights out operations, while others have begun to allow for remote access without fully addressing cybersecurity risks. Although there is some hesitation around the necessity of new federal requirements to enforce or address enforce ad address of this issue, there seems to be a general consensus that something needs to be done. To read more, visit utilitydive.com and sort, search GAO report for the article by Robert Walton. And what was his uh, Twitter handle? Team Wet Dog. At wet Team dog. Wet Dog. Yeah. We had a last minute edit, so I had put that in my old version, but I didn't send it out to you. It, it <laughs> fell behind. Sorry about that. <laughs> At Team Wet Dog. What a great tri- Twitter handle. So Let's good. just take a moment once again to uh, recognize the signs of stroke, because Brian, you seem a little bit confused and, and your English is not quite where it could be there. Or just, yeah, okay. what's my fine for that one? <laughs> We're getting a little loose. Uh, getting a little loose. Maybe maybe not reading the scripts beforehand. You know, it's the way it goes sometimes, especially when well, you do this. At did Aaron write that one for you? Yes. Yeah, that was why I put it out beforehand. Just uh, so that when I messed up, I could blame it on Aaron. Or my lack of preparation. Whatever one we want to go with. We come to this week with another Genesis forecast update. Power analyst confidence is the second lowest ever. March actuals came in 33% lower than forecast. April forecast increased 20% last month to 8,503, an indication that the model is indeed broken. May unchanged to 8,339 megawatts, average megawatts, June dipping 3% to 9,698, July almost unchanged to 8,000. 838 average megawatts. August also dipped 3% to 7,143, and September remains unchanged at 5,639. Because there's such a tight bound on generation in September, we're probably going to be pretty close to accurate on that one thing. We're going to return next month and try to be a little bit more confident and a little bit more accurate. Um, But we just need to say, Ian, we support you. We're all learning, and you're a Genesis apprentice. Nothing to feel bad about. It's uh, also when I wrote that the model is broken, I meant to say, of course, that I broke the Genesis model, not that there's an inherent flaw in the Genesis model. I take full responsibility for the failure of this. That was a a good caveat, um, and I appreciate (laughs) it, Ian. Uh, I don't know. I'm pretty sure John Olis watches most of these. I don't think we've convinced John Fazio to watch this yet. You should send him an email. Maybe not this month, though. Maybe we went to next month. <laughs> I'll send him an email asking him to help me once again to uh, to figure out where it's uh, where I'm failing. For those of you with friends that aren't from the utility world, are just joining the industry, or have zero background in the industry, and are planning to apply for the data specialist position at Classic and IPUD AA, a recent article by the Spokesman Review highlighted uh, highlighted in the lead energy um, in the energy digest excuse me 
I did write this one. Uh, provides <laughs> a great. <laughs> I apologize. I apologize. Provides a great uh, beginner's overview of this La Nina year. The article offers an easy read, lightly discussing typical weather patterns in the Pacific Northwest and otherwise during the event and the effect a strong snowpack year can have on the upcoming fire season. Search for the strongly alliterative article. The Relatively Wet Winter Whipped Washington Snowpack Back into Shape by Colin Tiernan. Also, for an introduction to hydropower generation locality, check out EIA's Hydropower Explained, where hydropower is generated. Okay, Public Power Underground Special Salmon War Correspondent Matt Shretnik returns to talk about Public Power Council's Blue Sky Initiative with Northern Wasco PUD's General Manager, Chair of Public Power Council's Executive Committee, and friend of the underground, Roger Klein. Roger, welcome to Public Power Underground. Thank, Thank you, you so Matt. much for joining me, sir. It's Hi. great to see you. To you as well. It's uh, been too long since we've seen all seen each other in person. So looking forward to it. Uh, I could not possibly agree more. Um, but diving into what Paul mentioned, I, am, uh, I, I have the uh, dubious uh, title of being the Special Salmon Wars Correspondent uh, for the Public Power Underground. Um, in that role, I've been fortunate to chat with Commissioner Downing uh, from the council. Uh, we, we talked a little bit about the specifics and impacts of uh, the Simpson proposal, which I know you're very familiar with. Um, also got to speak with uh, uh, the Director of Fish and Wildlife uh, at Bonneville, Crystal Ball. Um, but now, uh, as, we're, as we're moving forward and the region is starting to kind of coalesce on a, on a path forward, um, I'm grateful that you're willing to chat with us about where it is we may be headed. Um, you're the General Manager of Northern Wasco County PUD. Uh, you are the Chair of the PPC Executive Committee. Um, did I get those right? I am. Um, yes. And uh, in, in that capacity, I'm, I'm sure that is uh, uh, just two of, of many titles. Um, those are saying that your thoughts and opinions on these issues will carry weight. Um, I am sincerely appreciate, or, uh, I sincerely appreciate your willingness to share them with me. Um, Thanks, so, man. Yeah, thank you. Um, so let's lay it out. Uh, looking forward, uh, it seems that no matter where we end up, getting there is not going to be easy. Um, I was hoping you'd be willing to kind of set the foundation for our listeners uh, and share your perspective on the problem that it is that we're looking to solve at this point. Um, basically, nothing less than the future viability of Bonneville, of BPA, uh, and getting out of what seems to be an endless cycle of litigation. Um, conversely, if you see a bigger risk uh, than what we've come to call uh, the salmon wars, I'd like to hear that as well. Um, so um, opening it up, yeah, your thoughts, please. Thanks, Matt. So to follow, you know, member down in or crystal ball at Bonneville, those are, those are big acts to follow. I'll, I'll do my best to uh, keep it centered on uh, at least my view here from Northern Wasco County PUD. And then in my time as the chair of the executive committee of the public power council, uh, you know, the tasks before us are large. It's 2021. Uh, we're rapidly approaching the end of the current uh, contract with Bonneville power transmission for us, our preference as public power. Uh, though some have taken on the moniker of the salmon wars, and I can understand and appreciate where uh, Congressman Representative Simpson comes from in Idaho to, to state that is uh, his focus. Uh, I consider it a, a bit different, though the salmon war is his perspective for us as public power, thinking only about uh, our relationship with our preference provider, the Bonneville Power Administration and, and the generation asset owners and operators, the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers and the uh, Department uh, of Interior, the Bureau of Reclamation. I, mm -hmm. I think of those infrastructure assets and the cost to operate them to supply that clean renewable hydropower to us as preference customers so we can deliver it to our our customers, those that own us, um, you know, it's a single so sourced supply stack, non considering, not considering the Columbia generating station. Mm -hmm. uh, and what have those costs done throughout the life of the, the contract? You know, hockey stick up to the right. Uh, yep. uh, Got up. Almost a hundred percent increase over the, the life of the current contract. Um, and to be in, intellectually honest, not necessarily the full restoration of the, the fish that the, the programs have intended to recover or restore. Now, can you, 
can you place that solely on the dams? I, I don't think that's honest either. Uh, we, we look at dammed and non-dammed rivers across the West and the Northwest and, and uh, the area uh, that they all share in common, the ocean is having impacts on the aquatic species. Okay. So to say that only the power customers of the, us, you know, of Bonneville Power are the sole payers in, in this morass, and I, and I use that term lovingly, um, I don't think that's fair or equitable either. So I can understand and appreciate where Mr. Simpson comes from and, and trying to ensure the return of salmon and steelhead to Idaho, uh, but, but that's not the only issue. And, but, and I say that strongly, um, if that type of soundbite is what gets our uh, federal participation or support from our, our federal legislators, in DC actively involved. And, you know, I live in Oregon uh, to get Salem involved in a, a non litigious way. If that's mm -hmm. what that means, if that's what the outcome is, that's great. Um, for me, it's, it's the war on rates uh, for Representative Simpson. It's the war on salmon, uh, but for all of us, it's the war on our economic livelihood in the region. We uh, continue again to have that, those rate actions on those rate cases. And I haven't seen them go down yet in, in my 23 year career. Um, so, so I'm hopeful. Yeah. I'm, I'm hopeful that we can, can continue as public power to come together. Uh, doesn't mean we always have to agree because I, I don't think we do. And I don't think we're going to, uh, to recognize and appreciate the, the positive attributes of the federal system, the, the good parts of the current contract. There are some, and uh, continue to support and influence where we can and uh, you know, help Bonneville bring the, the right suite of products and services to us for the next contract period. And, and I'll be very frank, uh, today, right now, Bonneville's supplying about a third of my load uh, in the residential space, commercial, industrial, I have big data center loads here. So mm -hmm. for me, I need a, reliable uh, transmission system that I can bring a variety of power sources to, uh, to meet these growing needs. And I think about a future that looks different than the past when we think about that resource stack. When I read Bonneville's audited financials or their um, ratings from the, the rating agencies, it, they all mention that the thing that I think we've just taken for granted is that we're all single fueled for the most part. Yeah. The, the, so we're very weather dependent, snowpack dependent. Uh, we pay attention when there's things as drought. Um, from a legislation, state by state rule, carbon legislation piece, uh, I don't ever think we're gonna be overly worried of the price of natural gas other than it is the, the next dispatchable resource and we'll set that price. Um, but I, I think there are cool things happening uh, and other options available to us. Um, the integration of wind and solar and, and the increased performance and decreased cost of uh, storage technology. Uh, maybe you can have them on the, on the cast here in the future, but uh, Grant County PUD, Energy Northwest and uh, uh, X Energy signing the, the Tri-Energy mm -hmm. Partnership on uh, small modular reactor development in the region. Just this week? Yeah, a, a, diver a diversified stack I think benefits all of us. Uh, Absolutely. And whether it's a larger transmission system or a truly west-wide market or northwest market that allows us to bring kind of traditional market principles to us, to the region, to not only integrate uh, more intermittent renewables, but to take this same preference power that is essentially bought and paid for and can continue to provide uh, clean energy to our customers, to our communities. Uh, I think that's beneficial. I'm looking forward to that future. And whether it was, uh, again, the, the, the sound bite of the end the salmon war that got us all talking mm -hmm. and got some real engagement from the state capitals and the, and the folks in DC, the delegation, uh, that's, that's great. And I'm hopeful that that can turn into something. Uh, really cool. right. that, that's my goal. That's my blue sky. So here's the segue to the PPC, or the work that PPC is doing in my piece of it. Uh, just even this morning, uh, we had a, a long range planning uh, kind of quick committee meeting with 
Uh, Deborah Smith is the chair and the different mm -hmm. participants. And we're talking about exactly that. What kind of blue sky ideas can we as public power discuss uh, to, yeah, we'll, I'll borrow it, to, to end the salmon wars, right? Or to, to end, end the rate war is the way I look at it. Uh, does that mean uh, opening the Northwest Power Act? Could be. Uh, does that mean a different energy Northwest type entity in the future? And, you know, look, you look across the country, Tennessee Valley Authority, Western Area Power Authority, there are other relationships with uh, federal entities and regional entities and, and markets um, with JOAs and, and different groupings of public power that own transmission and, and distribution and generation and uh, you make it work. What's made it work for us for a long time in this bilateral agreement and arrangement is that the cost of the power was really low. Um, and hopefully that continues. Uh, but even if it doesn't, we're going to plan for maybe something different or something bigger. Um, that's that's the, the goal of the blue sky conversation. Like with any legislation, right? There, there's uh, unintended consequences. So what the original authors of the Northwest Power Act set out to do and where it ended up. I think you're the one that shared this one with me, right? Uh, one of the uh, crafters said, you know, congratulations, sir. You, you got everything you wanted. But, yeah, but the downside is so did everybody else. Right. That's so exactly right. yeah, what, what unintended consequences uh, happened that maybe we should go back and, and work with others collaboratively mm -hmm. to edit. And uh, I'll, I'll pause to breathe. Uh, th those are those are my thoughts, Matt. No, I appreciate it. Um, uh, yeah, heck of an overview there, sir. Um, I think, uh, you know, um, yeah, in keeping with the underground theme here, I think Ted Lasso probably said it best. And uh, uh, taking on a challenge is a lot like riding a horse. Uh, if you're comfortable while you're doing it, you're probably doing it wrong. Um, and so um, I, you know, I, I think I would want to identify resident, residential exchange as one of those issues uh, that is that is in there. Um, and that um, I will fully admit I do not want to talk about right now um, because I feel like we'd be here for a very long time. Um, but there are three things that I'm hoping to get your opinion on um, uh, that as part of the Blue Sky Initiative. I know, it, I know it's a relatively broad uh, concept, but I also know that there's three things in particular that are of interest uh, selfishly to myself. Um, looking forward, I think it's, uh, it, it's at least... Um, the goal of, of a number, uh, I think, I think just about everybody. Um, but uh, again, I'll speak only for myself here uh, to ensure that Bonneville is, is remains viable, right? Uh, and to your point, you know, we've had uh, costs have been increasing over time, and what can we do to help address those? Um, where are those costs appropriately allocated to power customers, and where can they be put elsewhere? Um, and again, to your point earlier, in an intellectually honest manner. Um, and so. Um, I'd be interested to hear your thoughts on FCRPS power cost allocation, uh, deauthorization of power production at certain Willamette projects, uh, and expanding um, Bonneville's 4H10C eligibility, um, or what is eligible for the 4H10C credit. Um, now, um, given our listener bases, uh, um, uh, I guess, uh, how much they already know about these subjects. Let's not go too far into them. Um, I'm going to give everybody a ton of credit in that. Um, I'm going to assume they all know what all of those things mean. Um, but I do want to know, uh, first of all, what do you think biggest bang for our effort for our buck? And uh, um, instead of diving into all those individually, I want to try and be respectful of uh, our listener and yours um, time. Um, so yeah, first, uh, do you think there's a, do you have a favorite? Let's start there. Um, I would love to hear why. Um, what do you think? Uh, what do you think is the, the biggest opportunity that's out there for us right now? So I spent just enough time outside of public power to fully appreciate the effort that it takes to uh, bring a rate case process before either a, a utilities commission or FERC. So uh, I, I think back and, and say, well, what would FERC do in, in this case? And it isn't always what Bonneville does. And that's my personal opinion. And that's why I'm not the attorney, Matt. It's- uh, In this context, neither am I. Okay, so, <laughs> so power cost shifting or cost shifting, uh, I, I believe in cost causation. So okay. whether it's a power cost or a transmission cost, it should be attributed uh, as such. Um, I recognize that for me, a very reliable, uh, and market appropriate transmission system um, is something that we can focus on as a region. I think we, our interests are much more aligned with non-public power in that regard than maybe we want to 
uh, realize or haven't realized yet. So um, I'm okay, <laughs> shoot me for saying it, but I'm okay if transmission rates go up because those costs are increasing and, and, and the need to be um, a reliable, have a reliable transmission system is necessary. Um, to me, fish costs are uh, power costs, at, at least mostly. So we'll we'll understand that. Uh, regard to the Willamette projects and deauthorization, or I'd even say reauthorization at a different mm -hmm. level of of uh, what the the power percentage is. Those projects specifically are near and dear to me because I used to help manage them as a federal employee. Uh, I've forgotten that. That's right. No, but I also recognize that. Uh, the mix is likely not correct, especially for the value that is uh, provided by them. Those are flood projects that kind of accidentally make power as they're moving water and uh, with a whole lot of official wildlife um, oversight. And that that's just the reality of it. And that's good because for those that live in the flood basin there, which is pretty much everybody, uh, even when hospitals, yeah, and even when hospitals get constructed where rivers used to combine, which is why it's called River Bend, uh, okay. it, it Flooding there is bad. I'll, I'll leave it at that. For our listeners, Springfield, Oregon has a, a relatively new hospital called Riverbend, but that's yes. a, a bit of a non sequitur. Yes, um, thank you. Yeah. Uh, and 4H10C, yeah, you got to give uh, credit where credit is appropriate. So if it's a fish and wildlife cost, it needs to be attributed as such. If it's a power, power cost, it needs to be attributed as such. And same with uh, flood risk management. Love it. Love it. Thank you very much, sir. Um, again, these are, uh, you know, these are big issues as we started with. I think you framed them well. I appreciate that. Um, it's they're difficult issues. Um, uh, but again, in keeping with the underground theme here, um, I believe in hope. Uh, I believe in believe, um, especially with folks like yourself in the driver's seat. Um, and so thank you very much for your time. Uh, before we close out here, I wanted to know if there's anything uh, you think the listeners of the underground need to know uh, that you're working on or anything else you'd like to promote. Please participate, please be active. Uh, you know, you can log into the public power council meetings. Uh, the, the joy of public power is, is all of our meetings are public, whether it's a cooperative or if you're a member of it or a PUD or what have you, or a municipality. So uh, participate, uh, ask your GM CEO questions, engage, uh, grow in the region. You know, there's many years ahead of us and, and it's, uh, it's, it's good work. So thank you. Can't think of a better advice for this listener base. Uh, thank you very much once again for your time, Mr. Klein. Um, always a pleasure. Uh, Thanks. With that, uh, we'll go back to Paul for school. Okay, that's all the news we're covering this week. Send us any news, jobs, questions, opinions, or corrections to Paul on Twitter, at the Power Manager, or if you're a friend of the underground, send any of us a note. Any corrections from last week, Paul? Thanks for asking, Brian. I was very self-conscious uh, last week as we were going through the article on the solid state battery technology. Um, very, uh, just not enough preparation going into that. And I apologize to all our faithful listeners. Uh, wanted to correct the record uh, and do some calculations this week. So um, the article stated that they could charge 500 kilometers of range in 10 minutes. That converts to 310 miles. So if the electric vehicle gets a modest 350 watts per mile, that means it needs 108.5 kilowatt hours of energy in 10 minutes. Uh, not including system losses, that means the utility needs to revive 650 kilowatts of power for those 10 minutes. That's two thirds of a megawatt, thus demonstrating the importance of charging speed fees in electric vehicle public charging rate design. That does round up to a megawatt roughly, but thank you for the combination charging speed fee promo and correction of the record, Paul. Absolutely. Captain Bledsoe, any commentary on this week's episode from the Grammar Police that you didn't was, already get to? There was just so many out there. It's like uh, when you're, if you're the cop on the highway and literally every single person is doing 80 in the 70, you gonna write any tickets for that? I don't no. think so. This so. sounds like very <laughs> to work every day. <laughs> yeah, in, fair, in fairness, it mostly was Guillory that was uh, driving aggressively with the English language today. But. Oh my gosh. Well, that was almost what a spit take over here. <laughs> <laughs> well, you got off with a warning, Guillory. Okay. So, uh, thanks, Captain. <laughs> We'll be back next week to talk about 
Public Power and Public Power Adjacent News. To make sure you don't miss an episode, you can sign up for an unintrusive newsletter with links to all the ways to consume this fascinating content on Substack at publicpowerunderground.substack.com. Otherwise, you can subscribe on YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcast, or your favorite podcast app. That's all for this week. Thanks for tuning in. Oh, yeah, just a little little bit there before we go to the, the end. Um, two things. First, we're recording a day earlier next week. So I think this is going to get published on Thursday. And secondly, we did a straw poll and I'm on vacation the week of May 4th. And we're going to, it, that it was voted that we weren't going to have an episode. Yeah, the week of May 3rd. If you, uh, as listeners, as dedicated listeners, to get all the way to the end, want an episode, you can override them. Uh, we just need to find somebody to volunteer as a guest. Um, but I'm going to say, you'd have to override some votes of other people. These two. <laughs> so if you want to peer pressure somebody, you peer pressure them. Uh, and you have to peer pressure someone to come on and take my place. This is my favorite moment. Okay. <laughs> That's all. That's it. Sorry for that editorial note. That's an editorial note. Hey, public power people. We're all in this together. No, this won't be forever. Hey, public power people. Public Power Underground is Northwest Public We're Power News from Power Department's perspective, together. presented for entertainment purposes. It's written, we edited, and produced by the Power yeah. Department. The views here expressed the views expressed here are our own and not the official views of Klotzkin IPUD nor of any organization of or, The views expressed here are our own and not the official views of Klotzkin IPUD nor of any person or organization affiliated or doing business with Klotzkin IPUD nor the organization of the guests also appearing on Public Power Underground. Now the Klotzkin IPUD nor those appearing on Public Power Underground generate ad revenue from the episodes. Make two, Kurt, Austin, Matt, and Roger feel better about their participation in this week's episode by sending them a note, text, or email with a thumbs up and telling them how much you enjoyed it. Do it for us, do it for them, and do it to make other people feel valued and appreciated. Public Power Underground for electric utility enthusiasts. Public Power Underground, it's work to watch.